Hello class, this is section 6.3. In this video, we are going to study product solutions for partial difference equations. So here we have our partial difference approximation. Again, remember that J refers to the approximate space variable and M refers to the approximate time variable. Our S is given by K delta T delta X squared, where delta T is the gap in time and delta X is the gap in space. It turns out to understand how solutions of this partial difference equation work and to understand when a solution is stable or unstable, it is helpful to go back to our tried and true method of looking for product solutions. So let's do that. We start by writing uj m as fj gm. So these fj and gm are constants. fj is a constant that just refers, that just depends on space and gm is a constant that just depends on time. And like we do in the continuous case, we simply plug this into the PDE, and this is what we get. This is our equation revolving f and g. Uh, let's also talk about our boundary conditions. So we have f0, gm is 0, and fn times gm is 0. But again, if gm is 0 for all m, then our u solution is just going to be 0 and the zero solution is not very interesting, even though it does technically solve the problem. So we ignore that. So we can assume that gm is not zero for every m. And this means we can afford to erase it, divide by gm. And this means that f0 and fn are both zero. So those are our boundary conditions. So let's go back to our PDE. And we do the same thing. We want to separate out the time variables and the space variables, so we should divide by fg, fj, and gm. And what we get is the following. So on the left side, we have an expression that only depends on the space variable, m. And on the right hand side, we have an expression that only depends on the time variable, j. The left side is independent of space and the right side is independent of time. Since they are equal, it means that both sides are independent of both space and time, which means that we can set both sides equal to a constant which we will call lambda. So the sign of lambda doesn't really matter here, but let's just stick with lambda positive to um, be consistent with the book. So we have two equations here. The first equation looks a lot easier, so let's do that first. In this case, we have g1 equals lambda g0, g2 equals lambda g1, which is equal to lambda squared g0. g3 is equal to lambda g2, which is equal to lambda squared g0. So this becomes lambda cubed g0. So you can see that um, in general, as we go down through time, gm is just going to be equal to lambda m g0 for g0 a constant given by the initial conditions. So the point is that um, gm is going to be equal to lambda m, so this is really, really easy. The other equation is a lot more interesting. We can rewrite it to look like this, so this looks a bit more familiar. And let's recall what we did to solve the eigenvalue problem for the continuous case. Remember, we had this substitution, fx equals erx. So let's try to do something, oh, um, we should include the boundary conditions too. So we had these boundary conditions. Let's include them into f0 equals fn equals 0. Right. So remember that for the continuous case, we had this fx equals erx term. For these boundary conditions, f0 equals fn equals 0, we had the imaginary r's. We only had the cosine and sine. So let's replace the r with a i theta. So the discrete version of this should clearly be fj equals to e i theta j, since we are in the discrete world. So let's see what that does to our equation. We plug it in, so we obtain e i theta j plus 1 plus e i theta j minus 1 equals lambda minus 1 plus 2s over s e i theta j. However, remember that e i theta j plus or minus 1, you can separate out 
the exponentials like so, plus or minus i theta. So we can separate out like things like that. And this, this means that we can divide by e i theta j, and what we're left with is e i theta plus e minus i theta equals lambda minus 1 plus 2s over s, with the e i theta j also being cancelled out. So remember that we had this rule that e i theta plus e minus i theta is just going to be equal to 2 cosine theta. This is the basic relationship between exponentials and cosines. So we get this. This relationship between lambda and theta. All right, so let's figure out what the theta is. And once we figure out what the theta should be, we can figure out what the n should be. So let's go back to our boundary conditions, f0 equals fn equals 0. So remember that when we write down the substitution, when we, when we write down fj equals e i theta j, when the r is imaginary, we can rewrite it in terms of sine and cosine. So our general solution is going to be fj equals c1 cosine theta j plus c2 sine theta j. Again, with the boundary conditions, f0 equals fn equals 0. So using the f0 equals 0 boundary condition, we get that f0 equals to c1, cosine of 0 is 1, and sine of uh, 0 is 0, so we just get c1 over here. And this implies that c1 is equal to 0. So indeed, our fj is reduced to c2 sine theta times j. And let's plug in the other initial condition. We have fn equals 0 as well. When we plug that in, we get fn equals c2 sine theta n. Our goal in eigenvalue problems is to find non-zero solutions. We already have here that c1 is 0. So if our fj is to be a non-zero solution, we need c2 to be non-zero. But c2 non-zero, um, and of course fn is zero, so this is equal to zero. So c2 non-zero only if the sine theta n is zero, because this product is zero, one of them has to be zero. So if c2 is non-zero, we need sine theta n to be zero. And it's pretty easy to see when that happens. This happens when uh, theta is equal to n pi over n for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now, actually, we can ignore the n equals 0 case because sine of 0 is just 0, and that just gets us a trivial solution. And we can ignore the negative case because, remember, um, sine negative theta is equal to minus sine theta, so they just give the same answer. So that's why we can just take the positive answers. So this will, what, this will be our eigenvalues for theta. And let's look at uh, what the, rem remember we have this relationship between lambda and theta. So let's call this theta n. And we have lambda n is equal to 2s cosine theta n um, plus 1 minus 2s. And of course, theta n is just what these are. So 2s is equal to cos 2s cosine n pi over n plus 1 minus 2s. So this, these are our eigenvalues, lambda n. And our eigenfunctions are given by fn equals sine n pi, or rather, sorry, um, this is our f, our eigenfunction. fn equals n pi over n times j. No, um, fn depends on j too. So these are our eigenfunctions with this eigenvalue. And this means that our product solutions are going to be u j m equals, um, so we have a constant. For g, we have a constant times lambda m. We just ignore the constant, and lambda is just going to be um, this thing. 2s cosine n pi n plus 1 minus 2s raised to the nth power times the eigenfunction sine n pi n j 